May 1940. Thousands of German tanks strike deep into Belgium, Holland, and France. And a new era in armored warfare begins. This is Blitzkrieg. Move fast, hit hard, move fast again. The Allies, stunned by the speed of the attack, send thousands of their own tanks to meet the advancing panzers. Once that armor starts rolling, it's damn difficult to stop it. For the first time in history, two giant armored forces clash. It becomes one of the greatest tank battles of the Second World War. There was fire everywhere, huge fireballs. We were absolutely blinded. At stake is nothing less than the fate of Western Europe. The situation is now absolutely desperate. This is the Battle of France. Sedan, France, on the Meuse River near the Belgian border. This pleasant rural countryside is dotted with crumbling concrete bunkers. Stark reminders of Europe's dark past, a time when the entire world teetered on the brink of disaster. September 1st, 1939. A German army, one and a half million men strong, streams across the border into Poland. And the Second World War begins. Already, Hitler's forces have annexed or conquered large swaths of Eastern Europe. In the spring of 1940, he turns his attention to the West. But the Western Allies are ready. Since the fall of Poland, France and Britain have been building defensive fortifications, stockpiling ammunition, and massing men and machines in Western Europe. The Allies believe they are ready for the inevitable German invasion. By May of 1940, they field almost three and a half million men, 14,000 artillery pieces, and 3,600 armored vehicles. A formidable defensive force that outnumbers and outguns the Germans. For their invasion, Germany has assembled 2.4 million men, more than 7,500 artillery guns, and only 2,500 tanks. Under conventional military doctrine, the attacker should always be stronger than the defender, but the German plan is anything but conventional. Their plan calls for 10 panzer divisions to charge west across a 400-kilometer front, with the main attack driving through the Ardennes forest. Their goal, surprise, divide, and destroy the Allies. The hilly, rugged Ardennes is considered poor terrain for tanks. Here, heavy armor can get bogged down in the deep woods and gullies. It's one of the most unlikely places for a panzer attack, and for that reason, it's perfect. At no point, the French High Command was prepared to suffer an attack in the Ardennes. The speed and ferocity of the German attack catches the Allies off guard. Still clinging to military tactics of the First World War, they are ill-prepared for General Heinz Guderian's new form of mobile armored warfare, the Blitzkrieg. Guderian and all the young panzer generals, they understood that speed and mobility and confusion um, are the key elements of the strategy. Creating a center of gravity, breaking through, piercing through it, then break out and create confusion and uh, terror so the enemy's army collapses.
More than 1,700 panzers cross the Ardennes with shocking speed. They cover 100 kilometers of difficult terrain in less than three days. And by May 13th, are only 300 kilometers from the English Channel. Reeling from the German attack, the Allies send all available forces east to intercept the Germans near the Meuse River. We receive urgent orders to rush forward and counterattack the Germans that had crossed the Meuse. We had to stop them and throw them back across the river to the other side. Spearheading the Allied counterattack and rushing headlong into the rapidly advancing panzers are three dozen French light tanks. The FCM-36 is well protected by 40 millimeters of frontal armor, but its short barrel 37 millimeter main gun is designed primarily for infantry support and is all but useless against Guderian's tanks. All of a sudden, we saw clouds of dust. We were surprised that it was German armor. It wasn't just two or three. It was more like dozens of panzers, and they were armed with cannons, with long barrels. Advancing towards the French are dozens of the formidable Panzer Mark III. It is armed with a long barreled 37 millimeter cannon, giving the Mark III much more killing power than the French tanks. We take the shell, we put it in the cannon, we aim and we fire. We don't have time to think. But we couldn't pierce their armor. I saw some of my comrades get hit first. They were dead without being able to do anything. It's awful to think that there's nothing you can do to help them. But they just couldn't defend themselves against the larger and more powerful German cannons. The FCM-36 were no match for the Panzers. The main drawback was armament, which was a short gun, which was almost useless against German armor. Our short cannon could not pierce their armor. All we could do is try to blind the drivers of the Panzers in front of us. It wasn't easy to aim. We were raising the cannon up and down with our shoulder to pick the area we wanted to hit. But we somehow managed. We don't even think if we're going to make it or not. We have to do what we can with what we have. That's all. If we get killed, then so be it. When shells hit our armor, the steel turns bright red. Inside the tank, shards of metal would fly out, pieces that were red hot and piercing. When we see a tank burning with shell holes and the crew inside, it hurts. We feel it and we try to avenge them. While I was looking, a German shell hit our turret. It didn't go through, but it shattered the periscope, and it fell on me, knocking me out. Um. 
My tank was the last to be knocked out. Of the 39 tanks that set out that morning at 11.30, only 10 remained. But we stopped the Germans. That was our goal. Despite their losses, the French tanks slow the German advance, forcing Guderian to change his plans. He decides to bypass the French defenders to the south and continue his lightning attack west. But as the German blitzkrieg cuts a narrow swath westward, its flank becomes increasingly extended and poorly defended. The French realize that this is just the break they need and send two battalions of their heaviest tanks straight into the vulnerable German flank. May 10th, 1940. Determined to dominate Western Europe, Hitler launches a massive blitzkrieg into Holland, Belgium, and France. The blitzkrieg, from a German point of view, was just the war of movement. They always tried to move fast, hit hard, move fast again. And create confusion and uh, terror in the backland of the enemy, so the enemy's army collapses. In just three days, the Germans advance more than 100 kilometers through the Ardennes forest. And the Allies, caught off guard, send all available forces east to meet the onslaught. Although their light tanks are outgunned and they sustain heavy losses, the French manage to blunt the German attack, forcing them to change their plans and proceed with their advance to the west. Guderian's panzers cut a 30-kilometer swath deep into France, but at a cost. His flanks are now overextended and vulnerable. On May 15th, the French attack the Germans' left flank, aiming to capture the strategic high ground at the French village of Stone. A small village of Stone was crucial. It was crucial for the Germans to hold it to secure their bridgehead, and also their move westwards. For this critical battle, the French have deployed 68 of their most formidable weapon, the heavy Char B-1 BIS tank. The most feared Allied tanks for the Germans, I think the most feared is the French Char B-1, a massive bulking tank with 60 millimeters of armor. The Char B was the, the nightmare of the German tank crews. The day of the battle was very nice. It was ideal for us. We had great visibility from our tanks. We could see far into the fields. We had to go into Stone on a scouting mission. But we didn't have a radio at the time, so we were on our own. We not only had to fight the Germans, but we had to prevent them from getting past us. Going up the hill, we didn't see anything. No sign or contact with the enemy. As we continued to advance, we still didn't see the enemy. So we had to keep our guard up while we moved forward. We first made contact when German machine guns on the water tower opened fire and started shooting at us. The Germans put a machine gun on the water tower. They were shooting at us and pinning down our soldiers. We had to fire our 75 millimeter at the water tower. So I drove up to get closer. I had to get into position to fire on the machine gun nest. So we could knock it out. 
On n'était pas fait pour ça, les déchargés, les déchargés. Quand j'étais sur le plateau, nous avons juste éliminer les et continuer. Nous avons conduit le char. J'ai continué à driver le tank. Nous avons dû avancer et continuer à engager les ennemis. So I was shooting the 75mm cannon. La raison pour laquelle We had to take that position and keep that hill. On garde cette colline -là. As the big French tanks reach Stone, they come under heavy fire from well-hidden German anti-tank guns. Inside the Char B, we were very confident that our strong armor would keep us safe from danger or injury. Nicknamed the Colossus, the Sharby One is protected by 60 millimeters of frontal armor, making it virtually impregnable. Combined with its incredible firepower, the Sharby One is the most powerful tank on the battlefield. And the deadliest foe of the German anti-tank gunners. The fire from three heavy enemy tanks threatened to wipe out the platoon. At one point, one of the giants stood sideways. Our left gun commander spotted a small rib surface in the middle of the enemy tank side. Apparently a kind of radiator. He aimed at it. A jet of flame shot out of the tank. Now the two field guns fired only at those little squares in the side of the 32-ton enemy tanks. At that moment, I decided to release a smoke shell so we could escape from there. Coming out of the smoke, there was an anti-tank gun right in front of us. He was getting ready to fire at me, but he didn't have time. I was too close and I couldn't fire. There was only one thing to do. I had to drive my tank over it. The crew of the anti-tank gun were raising their hands. I couldn't fire at them, so the tank commander took care of them. We left the village and went back to our base. Lucky to be in one piece. The French flanking attack at Stone fails and Guderian's panzers continue to push through the Ardennes, virtually unchecked. To Guderian's north, at the spearhead of the German advance, is the elite 7th Panzer Division, led by Germany's most famous panzer commander, Erwin Rommel. By May 14th, Rommel and his tanks reach the Belgian village of Favion their last obstacle before the flat, open country leading to the English Channel. If they can break out here, Rommel's highly mobile panzers will be just a few days from the coast, threatening to split the Allied armies in half. May 15th, 1940. It's been five days since the beginning of Hitler's invasion of France, and his mighty panzer divisions have already bludgeoned their way 150 kilometers through the rugged Ardennes. Repeated attempts by French armor have failed to stop the German blitzkrieg, and they're now 250 kilometers short of their objectives along the English Channel. Leading the way is Erwin Rommel's mighty 7th Panzer Division. We're on the verge of breaking out of the Ardennes and into the panzer-friendly Belgian flatlands. In desperation, the French rush 170 tanks of their powerful 1st Armored Division north to head Rommel off near the Belgian village of Flavion. 
But the French advance is slowed by tens of thousands of refugees who choke the roads and block their path. We had to cross a crowd of refugees. It took us five hours to cover just five kilometers. The fields were filled with a crowd that was completely lost and insane. Bit by bit, the French managed to push through the human chaos and finally reach Flavion. The French tankers are exhausted and now critically short on fuel. As the French rest and wait for resupply, they are spotted by the 7th Panzer's advance guard. It's more than Rommel could have hoped for. Before him, and completely unaware of his presence, lies the French 1st Armored Division. Rommel splits his Panzer force in two and moves them into position on either side of the oblivious French tanks. His deadly trap is now set. Any encounter between German and Allied tanks has got to have been a surprise. And usually, the result of those battles, as much as anything else, is just like a Western gunfight. It's the guy who keeps his cool and gets his shot off first. Hit string against the armor on the left side. My driver shouts, there's a tank by the edge of this wood. I realized then that the whole of our left flank is packed with German tanks. What the Germans did was to build circles around them, move around them and shoot on them from every side. The German tanks um, tried to act like wolf packs. They tried to get around isolated um, Chardillon which was quite easy because the Allied tanks were scattered among the battlefield, so they picked one out, already using the radio to, to say, let's pick this one on the right half, the first tanks. So all the tanks were concentrating on this one lonely Charby one. Surprised and low on fuel, the scattered French tanks are all but helpless against the Panzer ambush. After some minutes of battle, each French tank was fighting for itself. And at most for the tank on his left and the tank on his right. Red flashes and a crash on our armor. One shot strikes the side door, which bangs open, half mangled. Imagine, you, you are a tank commander. You are alone in your turret. You have to lead your tank. You also have to man, to man your gun. You have to sight. You have to choose your enemy. You have to fire and you have to do everything. You are like a tambourine man inside a coffin of steel. In the French tank, the man in the turret was just seeing through the slit, this view hole, and he was seeing just rotating tanks around him. And he, he couldn't revolve the turret just to keep track with one. Not, not to speak of five or six or seven. One hits into our radiator. Another shell strikes our 75 millimeter gun, jamming it. The noise is deafening as we are hit from all sides, but we keep firing with the 47 millimeter cannon. When you confuse the, the enemy, um, enemy tank crew enough, and if you shoot enough, sometimes you will hit the tracks, you will hit something vulnerable, or they simply will give up under the pressure. My right track is rattling furiously, and my 47 mm gun has been worked so hard that the bolt could not be closed, so we withdraw slowly. The 
German, the German tanks would find a weak spot, would take them out somehow, and then concentrate on the next. Like animals jumping from one point to the other, like really the predatory animals on the next uh, victim. Avion is a, a terrible uh, place for uh, the French tank force. The division was completely smashed up. It was unable of any other action. Rommel's attack destroys two entire tank battalions. And by the end of the day, the French 1st Armored Division, originally 170 tanks strong, is reduced to just 36. The victory at Flavion allows the Germans to break out of the rugged terrain of the Ardennes and into the tank-friendly country of western Belgium. And they advance to the sea at full speed. Allied command scrambles to mount another counterattack against the ever-lengthening German flank. And now the stakes are even higher. If the Blitzkrieg can't be stopped, all of Western Europe will be lost. May 1940. Allied armies fight to stop the German invasion of Western Europe, but it's a losing cause. After almost obliterating the French 1st Armored Division at Flavio, General Erwin Rommel's panzers break out into the open country of Western France and Belgium and race almost unopposed towards the English Channel. The French High Command, desperate to stem the German onslaught, quickly tries to reorganize their armored forces at Stone. Their mission is to slice through the German southern flank and cut their lines of communication and supply. But five days of constant German attacks have taken a heavy toll on the French. Their army is racked by severe disorganization, and at the last minute they call off the attack. But in the confusion, the message doesn't reach the 49th Tank Battalion. And on May 15th at 5.30 p.m., Without artillery or infantry support, they begin their advance towards the German line. With our five tanks, we emerged from the woods. We were surprised by an artillery barrage. But we had to go through it, although we couldn't see. There was fire everywhere, like huge fireballs and huge chunks of earth. We were absolutely blinded by it all. We got beaten up. We had to look for a way out. So at that moment, we began to assemble into line formation and throw ourselves into the attack. Having just made it through the barrage, we immediately came under fire by anti-tank guns. The French have driven straight into a trap. A V-shaped killing zone where German anti-tank guns are positioned to catch the advancing tanks in a deadly crossfire. When an anti-tank gun fires at you, it makes a deafening noise. And when it hits, it leaves a mark inside the tank. It creates a weird effect. What I was afraid of is all the fuel we had inside at the time. We had 400 liters of gasoline. Never mind the 80 shells inside. If ever there was a fire or a spark in there, the tank becomes a bomb. I got hit 17 times from the anti-tank guns. 
12 on the right, and 5 on the front. When an anti-tank gun fires at you, it creates a long flame. So I was able to detect them like that. When I saw a flame, I turned around because I wanted to aim where it was coming from. They couldn't turn and run away. So I aimed and fired. I destroyed three anti-tank guns. We turned and saw the captain of our company 10 meters in front of us. His tank had gone down a ravine and got stuck in a stream. The driver was killed by a shell that went through his hatch. It's very different when you have comrades that are injured. It changes everything. So we tried to save as many as we could. We turned around and there was another tank commander. He gave us a sign that his driver was severely injured. We drove closer and brought them into our tank. We wound up with nine people in the tank, being stuck like sardines. At that moment, I couldn't fight anymore. With the recoil of the gun, I couldn't fire. So I drove to the forest to bring the wounded to the ambulance. The French attack fails. And the German blitzkrieg continues rolling west towards the sea. The formidable panzer columns now seem unstoppable. The Germans, they were always up there. They were always pushing. They were always scaring people and you never quite knew how and where to react to that. Once that armor starts rolling, it's damn difficult to stop it. On May 20th, 10 days after the invasion began, the vanguard of Guderian's panzers reaches the English Channel at Abbeville, France, and cuts the Allied forces in half. The situation for the Allies is dire. They must relink their armies before the Germans can bring up reinforcements. And they prepare for one last do-or-die attack. It will be the decisive tank-on-tank -tank clash in the Battle of France. The German blitzkrieg into Western Europe enters its 10th bloody day. The vanguard of Guderian's tank force reaches the English Channel, cutting the Allied armies in half. But the Germans' speedy advance has left them a thin and weakly defended Panzer Corridor. And hoping to exploit this, the Allies mount one last assault, aimed at smashing through the German flanks. The plan, a pincer movement near the city of Arras, with British tanks attacking from the north and the French from the south. But the plan falls apart when the French army, fatally weakened by 10 days of continuous fighting, fails to reach Arras in time for the attack. Without the French, the Allied tank force is reduced by almost half, leaving them with only 2,000 men, 48 field guns, and 88 tanks. It is a small force, easily outmatched by the tanks of Rommel's 7th Panzer Division. But the Allies realize time is running out, and despite the heavy odds against them, they launch their attack. 
I was stopped at a, a little village just outside Arras to join the, the tanks that were already out there. We had about five or six Matildas then, so we set off. We just kept going as fast as we could. We were told to shoot to kill. The Matilda II is equipped with a two-pounder cannon, capable of destroying German armor at a range of 1,500 meters. But its most impressive feature is its 78 millimeters of frontal armor, making the Matilda II the best protected tank on the battlefield. The tank that was causing the most nerve on the German side was the Matilda. It wasn't fast, um, its gun wasn't so, so impressive, but the thick armor was impenetrable for everything the Germans had. The main anti-tank gun on the German side was a 37mm um, anti-tank gun. This proved so ineffective that it was called army knocking machine. So because it didn't anything but knock knock and then the tank drove on, so that was the nickname for this gun. With no way to stop them, the Matildas overrun German positions, sending panic through the lines. With his forces wavering and in retreat, Rommel rushes to Arras to take personal command. We arrived at Wally. The enemy tank fire had created chaos and confusion among our troops. We drove off to a hill west of the village where we found a light anti-aircraft troop and several anti-tank guns located in a small wood. At the same time, several enemy tanks were advancing down the road. It was an extremely tight spot. May 21st, 1940. In a do-or-die bid to stop the Nazi invasion of Western Europe, the British attacked German positions in the French city of Arras. We just kept going as fast as we could. We were told to shoot to kill. British Matilda II heavy tanks lead the attack and easily eliminate the lighter German armor. Desperate to prevent a British breakthrough, Rommel deploys his 88mm anti-aircraft guns in a defensive line and orders them to fire at the advancing Matildas. Every gun was ordered to open rapid fire immediately. I personally gave each gun its target. When they brought the 88mm, they were go through any tank. The German 88mm Flak 18 gun was designed as a long-range anti-aircraft weapon. And when used against tanks, this high-velocity cannon can easily penetrate the thickest Allied armor, even at ranges of over one kilometer. So, that was only time we were pretty frightened. the enemy tanks so perilously close, only rapid fire from every gun could save the situation. We ran from gun to gun. The objections of the gun commanders, that their range was still too great to engage the tanks effectively, were overruled. All I cared about was to halt the enemy tanks by heavy gunfire. Well, we could see the German tanks on the horizon, and as soon as they saw us, they started firing at us, you see. Well, two of our tanks were blown up, you see, just, just like that. I'd 
can see him now. One of the tanks uh, backing up this road and shooting with his machine guns. Then that was it. Soon we succeeded in putting the enemy tanks out of action. We now directed our fire against another group of tanks attacking. Setting fire to some, halting others, and forcing the rest to retreat. I had a mate killed in one. He noted had his head shut off. Tank, tank commander, he'd open, open visor. On his head off. So that was a bit sickening then. Although we were under very heavy fire from the tanks during this action, the gun crews worked magnificently. So that was retreat. All right, retreat. That was the only, only way we got retreat. No, we couldn't, uh, there's nothing else we could do. Rommel's victory at Arras is hard won. The Germans have sustained their heaviest casualties of the campaign, losing 30 panzers and more than 600 men. But the British have suffered far worse. Just 28 of the original 88 tanks make it back to their lines, and hundreds of men are killed and wounded. After Arras, and after the fighting in Western France, we have lost virtually all our tanks, all our anti-tank guns. As far as Britain itself is concerned, the situation is now absolutely desperate. German divisions reach the coast, and by June 4th, the last British troops evacuate France at Dunkirk. Three weeks later, France surrenders. The quick and decisive German victory is a testament to the power of Blitzkrieg. And most crucial to their success are their mighty panzer formations. In 1940, the tank has come of age. The tank is now the leading player in the ground war. It's what brings France to her knees and kicks Britain out of France. So A huge number of soldiers have uh, lost uh, their lives for the defense of uh, France. Especially in the tank forces, all the men have uh, fought fiercely with hope that their uh, action would stop the enemy. We lost the Battle of France. We were simply overwhelmed by the enemy's equipment. We had nothing to go against this mass. Losing war is one thing. Losing hope is another. The fall of France is considered one of the greatest military victories of all time. With it, Hitler achieves what most thought impossible, total Nazi domination of Europe. <laughs>